Good morning, uh, good day, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the ECOMO's uh, International Scientific Committee workshop on the historic uh, thematic framework. Uh, we're very pleased with the reception the historic thematic framework is receiving and particularly in the participation in today's workshop. The mission of the IC20C is to advocate for and support the conservation of and, the, and honor significant buildings and sites of the 20th century. The IC20C has developed three useful documents to support conservation globally. The first one is the Madrid New Delhi document, Approaches to the Conservation of 20th Century Heritage, published in 2017. It is a foundational document of our committee, um, and I encourage you to um, find it and use it if you don't already. The second one is the CADES document and the NOVA Concrete Guidelines for Conservation of Concrete Heritage, uh, particularly uh, oriented to uh, a European audience. Um, and it was published in uh, 2021. That also has a wide applicability as well. The third is the historic thematic framework. And it is a tool and it's a wonderful tool for assessing heritage places um, and uh, what is also on our website at isc20c.org. The historic thematic framework document, I think has three very useful uh, purpose, uh, uh, opportunities. The first is to provide a structure and methodology for considering significance in, in a thematic context. The second is a framework for considering context associated with a significant property. And the third, I think really important and part of today, is stimulating a healthy reconsideration of significance and a discussion essential to maintaining relevance and equity in heritage conservation. I'd like to thank the team at the Getty who put together the thematic framework document and organized, significantly contributed to organizing uh, this program today. I'd also like to thank Greta Pandapadon, ISC20C Vice President, and Nitya Iyer, an emerging professional working with the ISC Bureau for their work in organizing the workshop today. If you're not a member of the ISC 20C, we encourage you to go to our website and explore what we, uh, the scope of our work, and we, en we encourage you to join. We'd love to have you as a member. Now I'd like to turn it over to Greta, and I look forward to the program. Thank you for being a part of it. Thank you. Can I have the next pl slide, please? So I'll just give you a quick overview of today's program. It falls in two parts. First, we will have an introduction to the framework by the Getty team. Susan will tell about the background and uh, Gail Ostergrain and Chandler McCoy will uh, take you through the program and its 10 themes. Then after 45 minutes, we will have a five minute break. And after that, we will start the round table. The round table will start with, with three short presentations by our uh, three guest speakers, James Duet, Jens Tofko, and Elaine Harwood. And thereafter, we will have a discussion for about half an hour. Thank you. Oh, good evening, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us um, today. We're delighted to have so many of you with us. Uh, my name is Susan McDonald, and actually, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, my name is Susan McDonald, and I'm one of the vice presidents for ICOMOS ISC20. And one of my roles has been to advance this project to create the 20th century historic thematic framework, um, something I've been involved in since 2009. Um, but I'm also um, the head of the Buildings and Sites Department at the Getty Conservation Institute, um, the organization that has been collaborating with the ISC20 um, since 2011, and then eventually taking on the role to um, commission and consult on and to create and publish uh, this document and who is now collaborating with the ISC 20 to disseminate the work. And I'm very grateful to my ISC 20 colleagues uh, for organizing um, tonight's event and to my Getty colleagues as well. 
So this is the third regional workshop to date. Um, with, we've had others um, with colleagues in Africa and the Middle East, and we today we're delighted to introduce this to colleagues, practitioners who are working in Europe. And today we hope to provide a good introduction to the framework itself. Um, but also to explore the ways that the framework um, can be used to advance the recognition, identification, assessment, conservation and interpretation of, um, of heritage, specifically in the European context. And I'm very grateful to have um, three fantastic speakers who will illustrate the thematic approach in practice. Um, its relevance and use in other regions of the world will be explored in more specific detail in some future workshops that we are actually planning. But let me give you a very quick background to the, the 20th century historic thematic framework. The project was first initiated by the ICMOS ISC 20 back in um, 2009, and it was prompted by two issues. The first one of those was that there were too many heritage places from the 20th century that were at risk of demolition and irreparable damage and were being lost around the globe. And support for 20th century heritage was not consistent internationally. And despite some countries being able to very strategically start to proactively identify and list places and then protect them, um, this wasn't happening universally. Um, also, the types of places that were being protected often focused more um, on the um, iconic um, architectural works uh, of modernity. And um, at that time, largely from um, European masters, but also from the diaspora of architects working in different places. And we felt there was an opportunity to recognize um, a greater range, a broadening of understanding of the types of places that truly represented the history and the processes and practices um, of um, history that happened uh, beyond um, that particular canon. Um, there was also a recognition that we needed to broaden the, the scope of the types of heritage places that were being recognized beyond architecture to look at landscape, industrial heritage, urban areas, even archeological sites of the 20th century. So this was how could we broaden the types of heritage places and the values that they, that they might be considered were important. So how could we broaden the values that were being considered beyond architectural and aesthetic and to recognize the other values that typically we think about scientific, historic, social, spiritual, and so on. These, these values that are typically used in contemporary practice. So the second catalyst for this work was the fact that there was a slow um, but increasing number of World Heritage nominations that were coming through the system and the World Heritage Center and its advisor ICOMOS were having some trouble being able to contextualize these places and also to undertake the comparative analysis um, in order to justify outstanding universal value. And there was also a feeling that there was a need to stimulate a broader range of type of, type of places beyond the canon of um, the European modern movement. So um, these were all things that were catalyzing this, uh, the, these particular ideas. So the challenge for the ISC 20 at that point was what could ICOMOS do to help stimulate and catalyze and support different cities or countries to start to more proactively and um, systematically assess and recognize the broad range of heritage places that represent the 20th century and more strategically approach their recognition and conservation and also encourage the broader full range of types of places that were important and were unique to each one of their specific contexts. Um, and to be doing this both um, at the local level, but also at the national and the international level. So the thematic approach was one that was well known internationally, um, used by the World Heritage Center. It's a credible approach. It's reasonably well used. Um, and it has a number of benefits that we thought which is why we thought this could be a potential approach. And we saw there was an opportunity to develop a tool that could help kickstart such efforts in different parts of the world, but recognizing that each country or, or region or city was going to have to examine, of course, its own history, their, its own places, and to contextualize them and do their own studies. But could such an ambitious idea of a global framework help them to start that particular process off? And then they would be able to use that as a benchmark or a reference point. How relevant might these international themes be to their unique situations? How might it help them look holistically and broadly at 
the heritage places that the communities that they might be working with would be um, might find of value. How might it be a way to connect the necessary academic and research work that we undertake as the first part of the process in heritage to communities and link that history, that, his, that um, rigorous work to ideas that people have about their own histories and their connections with places and how they might be able to recognize how the places that they value might connect to these, these um, formal historic studies. So um, we did recognize that such an ambitious idea of creating a global thematic um, historic framework um, needed some concerted effort and scholarship. So at that point, we started to look for some funding. It was very difficult to undertake such work um, from um, a professional but volunteer organization. And at that point, the GCI um, agreed to offer some support in first exploring whether this idea had any real um, legs and eventually to join a collaboration. And in 2015, the Getty um, agreed to take on the project and worked with the peer review group, um, consultants, and the ISC 20 to develop the historic thematic framework, um, which was then published in 2021. Um, can I have the next slide, please? But um, without further ado, let's get jump into hearing more about this document, about this particular look, work, and learn a little bit about its development, um, its themes themselves and the way that it could be used to explore, interpret and advocate for 20th century heritage. So it's my great pleasure now to introduce two members of the GCI team uh, and, and co-authors of this document, uh, Chandler McCoy and, and Gail Ostergren. Uh, Chandler manages the Conserving Modern Architecture Initiative here at the GCI um, and he has uh, oversees our broad range of programs and he is one of the co-authors of this particular document. And um, Dr. Gail Ostergren uh, is a research specialist with the Getty Conservation Institute. Again, is one of our co-authors, oversees a number of um, our publication related works and in, was involved in a number of our uh, conserving modern architecture projects at all. Um, just a reminder that, you know, feel free to start dropping questions into the Q&A. Um, we um, will be using these as part of the round table and um, uh, take it away, Chandler and Gail. Good day, welcome everyone. Um, as Susan mentioned, uh, my colleague Gail and I are going to give a, a quick presentation that gives some background on the thematic framework and then um, looks at the actual themes and um, Gail and I are going to be speaking together um, and sharing this presentation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, published in early 2021, the 20th Century Historic Thematic Framework is a tool to assist in identifying and contextualizing 20th century heritage places. It's intended to, in, to promote broad thinking about the historical processes that shape the 20th century globally. To do this, it, it identifies the principal social, technological, political, and economic phenomena that influence the built heritage within this one the built environment within this 100 year period. It identifies 10 overarching themes that capture all of this in succinct essays that explain each theme. It was a joint project between the Getty Conservation Institute and ECOMOS International Scientific Committee on 20th Century Heritage, which you've already heard explained known as the ISC 20C. As Susan stated, the ISC-20C initiated the effort to help develop the framework and the GCI began working with them in 2015. In 2016, the GCI established an internationally representative project reference group to advise on the project. It included representatives from Tiki, Docomomo, ICOMOS, ISC-20C, plus five regional representation, representatives from around the world. The 20th Century Historic Framework was written by a multidisciplinary team that included both consultants and Getty staff. Next slide, please. The catalyst for the work was the lack of recognition and protection for 20th century heritage and the need to contextualize it when making decisions about the listing of heritage places. In addition, the, 20, the ISC 20C was especially interested in helping the World Heritage Center identify a more diverse array of 20th century sites 
and to foster comparative analysis of sites and felt a thematic framework for the 20th century would serve this purpose. We wanted to look beyond the works of the great 20th century architects and the iconic works of modernism that currently dominate the World Heritage List and look more holistically at the full range of significant 20th century heritage places. We wanted to create a tool that would help broaden our thinking about significant places from the last century to cover a wide variety of heritage typologies, including buildings, cities, industrial heritage, and landscapes. And we wanted to produce a framework that could be used globally and adapted to local or national contexts. Next slide. There are several common approaches when used, used when undertaking research for preparing registers or heritage inventories, and I'll go through these. The most common are the chronological approach in which places from a certain time period are selected, such as the interwar period or the 20th century. There's the architectural approach in which places are selected because they fit into an architectural category or style, such as art deco or modern movement. There's the biographical approach in which the works of a particular architect, engineer, or landscape architect are, are selected. There's the typological approach, which selects places from a certain building type. And finally, there is the thematic approach, which starts with identifying broad themes from the history of a location and then identifies the places that re represent these themes. The three speakers that participate in the roundtable after the break will demonstrate how they have used the thematic approach in their individual heritage survey projects. Hopefully, these three presentations will illustrate the usefulness and flexibility of the thematic approach. Next slide. Oh, often these, I'm sorry, I moved a little too fast. Um, these five approaches are frequently used in combination. All right, uh, this slide shows um, a variety of thematic frame, national thematic frameworks. Um, the thematic frameworks are not a new idea and they're used in a number of places. We see the graphics here that depict the themes that make up the national thematic frameworks for Australia, Canada, and the United States. While expressed differently, there is a lot of commonality in these themes. And each of these graphics tries to demonstrate that the themes are interconnected. These three frameworks identify themes that are unique to each individual country. By contrast, the 20th century historic thematic framework identifies themes that characterize global de developments over the course of the century, and thus they can be used around the world to help identify 20th century heritage. Now my colleague Gail Ostergren will take over and explain how the document is organized and introduce you to the 10 themes. Yes, hello, thank you, Chandler. Um, uh, as as has both Chandler and Susan have already mentioned, um, the 20th century framework identifies and explores these 10 themes uh, that represent broad historical processes that played out globally during the 20th century. And each you know, I, I think we should move to the next slide. Oh, sorry. Yes, thank you. No. <laughs> I'll, I'll get with the rhythm here. <laughs> um, so each of these 10 themes is explored in an essay in this document. Um, the framework also identifies types of places that represent each of these themes. And then it's well illustrated with photos of a diverse range of actual places that reflect the themes. And um, the images that you'll see throughout this presentation are uh, images that appear in the in the um, thematic framework. Next slide, please. Uh, you've seen this graphic several times. This is a, a representation of the 10 themes, and, and you can see they cover a, a wide range of, of topics. Um, in developing the framework, we considered a, a vast array of possible themes and topics, and we distilled them into these 10. Uh, which we think identify really the principal social, technological, political, and economic drivers that shape the 20th century um, globally. And within each theme, we identified a number of sub-themes that further articulate um, the theme. I just want to note that not all of the themes are, are represented in all places, but 
I think they are broad enough that we think that there's some aspect of all of these themes that, that would be represented in most places around the world. Uh, next slide, please. So I, I have the pleasure of, of quickly touching on each of the 10 themes, just to give you a, a sense of uh, the contents of the document and, and how it is put together. So I'm going to start with the first theme, which is rapid urbanization and the growth of large cities. Now, obviously, cities have been growing and evolving for thousands of years, but they really grew exponentially during the 20th century, both in terms of their physical size and population. Um, and when many of us think of the impacts of rapid urbanization on the built environment, the first things that might come to mind are these you know, large structures like skyscrapers or freeways or the large post-war housing estates that you see images of here. Um, but the theme is also exemplified by uh, places like Soweto Township uh, outside of Johannesburg, these informal settlements that formed um, as new migrants came to urban areas throughout the century. Uh, next slide. So as we mentioned, uh, each of the 10 overarching themes is broken into a number of sub-themes um, that link the, the big theme to types of places. And then finally, from that, you can begin to link to individual places or actual places. And so to clearly convey this information, each theme essay is accompanied by a chart like this, which lists a number of sub-themes in the left-hand column and a wide range of types of places that exemplify the theme in the right-hand column. So for example, on, on this uh, uh, chart, which is from the um, theme one, rapid urbanization and the growth of large cities, the first two sub-themes, the first two bullet points are mass migration to urban areas and the decline of smaller towns. And the second one is increasing city size, population and density. Now these are really broad um, sub-themes and they're associated with a wide variety of, of types of places probably just about every place in this in this uh, chart would fall under those sub themes but i'm going to point out a few that are really obvious new towns and planned cities or various types of infrastructure like water and sewage um, as well as places like shanty towns um, or we could take another example the very last sub theme redeveloping and re renewing inner cities this could be related to types of places like social housing and housing estates or civic landscapes and public parks now, not all of the sub-themes or types of places uh, in this chart are going to be found in every locale, but this also is not an exhaustive list. It's really a starting point um, that we encourage users to, to take and to examine and modify, add to, delete from, um, based on their own geographic and um, uh, historic and cultural contexts. All right, the next slide, please. The second repeating element uh, that goes with each of the theme essays is a photo gallery uh, that accompanies, um, I, I'm sorry, it's a photo gallery that illustrates and describes a wide range of actual places that could be identified under this theme. Um, this example again is from rapid urbanization chapter and it shows two types of related infrastructure. We have the Kuwait water towers uh, and we have the Woodland Cemetery crematorium. Um, just as examples of the types of places that relate to this expansive urbanization. Uh, we are not proposing sites for listing in this document. Um, these are merely examples of types of places that relate to the theme and the sub-themes, and they're intended to provoke really broad thinking. Um, some of these places may already be identified as heritage. I think both on the screen now are, but many of them are not, and some of the uh, places we've used as examples probably never will be identified as heritage. Um, next slide, please. Now I'm gonna run through the rest of the 10 themes uh, to give you just a sense of the content without going into the depth of, of looking at the uh, um, sub-theme charts or the photo galleries. So the second theme uh, has to do with the dramatic acceleration of scientific and technological development, which had marked effects on life and on the built environment around the world in the 20th century. Um, these changes can be seen in places as varied as this hospital facility at top left, uh, which brought improved health care to rural areas, a rural area of Mauritania, um, to the space age looking Futuro house at bottom left. Uh, this, this example is located in France. Um, and this exemplifies the use of new building materials, in this case, plastics, 
uh, as well as the prefabrication of residential structures. Um, this theme encompasses many other topics like space research and exploration, uh, development of new sources of energy, the application of scientific research to the development of new products and services. Next slide. <clears throat> the demand for food grew along with the world's population over the course of the century. Um, subsistence farming did persist uh, in many places around the world, but in much of the world, increasing mechanization and the emergence of industrialized food production led to really dramatic changes to rural landscapes. Um, this is exemplified here by this rotary milking parlor in what was then East Germany, um, and by this massive tra tractor factory in Russia at the top of the screen. Um, Large-scale farming also required huge amounts of water, sometimes met through agricultural irrigation schemes like the Bakra Dam in India, uh, shown here, which also provided um, hydroelectric energy. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Growth in the globalization of trade led to significant changes in political power structures and cultural landscapes around the world during the 20th century. Uh, and this theme discusses five major trends in world trade, including the evolution of international trading relationships and changing port landscapes, both of which are exemplified by the Panama Canal. International trading relationships are also represented here by the Fiat Taliero building in Asmara, Eritrea. Uh, this was built by the Italian car company in what was then the industrial center of East Africa. So it exemplifies the expansion of colonial um, trading relationships in the first half of the century. And uh, for better or worse, the emergence of global franchises in the 20th century is represented here by um, this McDonald's hamburger stand, which happens to be the oldest existing one. Uh, and it's right here in California. Um, the next slide, please. Many of the 20th century developments in mass communications and transportation systems were in fact the further evolution of um, earlier technologies. You know, for example, rail transport and telephones. Um, using the example of the public payphone, uh, this was really introduced in the late 19th century, but its reach grew across the 20th century and it provided widespread access to telephone service. Um, since the recent explosion in the use of mobile phones, this once ubiquitous bit of communications infrastructure has become increasingly rare. Um, you know, many people know about the iconic British red phone boxes uh, that have already been recognized as heritage. Um, but what about Brazil's much beloved public phone kiosks seen here at left? Um, there are, you know, people calling for its recognition as heritage. I personally think they're terrific. Um, of course, many of the new forms of transportation like air travel and mass communication like radio and television really were 20th century um, innovations. And we see a couple of examples here. Uh, next theme, please. Next slide. All right, the 20th century was an era of political, social and economic uh, revolution through both violent and peaceful means. Governments were formed based on emerging and evolving uh, political ideologies. Much of the century was marked by the great ideological divide between the capitalist and the communist blocs. Many new nations came into being as European colonial empires were dismantled and with the fall of the USSR. Uh, governments also banded together to form international institutions such as the UN um, to establish international law and to address a diverse array of global issues among them human rights. Um, there's a wide array of places that were selected to represent this really expansive theme from the UN headquarters to Robben Island in South Africa, to this the massive Palace of Par Parliament in Bucharest, to this um, spiraling concrete monument to the reunification of the French and English speaking Cameroons um, following decolonization. Next slide, please. All right, parallel movements advocating the preservation and protection of heritage buildings and natural landscapes emerged in the 19th century, but they really came to fruition in the 20th as the public asked governments to protect places that were important to them. Over the course of the century, conservation practice was gradually professionalized and institutionalized at the local, national, and international levels. This led to the development of formal legislation and processes to identify, protect, and conserve both natural and cultural heritage. In the last quarter of the century, 
the understanding of what constitutes heritage expanded to encompass a wider range of places, including those that embody social and intangible values. Next slide. All right, over the course of the 20th century, uh, many societies experienced higher living standards, and this included increased access to recreation and um, more personal leisure time. For many, there were more opportunities to participate in a wide range of popular cultural um, activities. And people also increasingly used their leisure time to travel further from home. This trend was facilitated by faster modes of transportation and by the development of tourism related um, infrastructure. So the five places shown here demonstrate very different aspects of this broad theme, including competitive sports, pop amusements, travel and tourism, and cinema. Next slide. Now, while religious, educational, and cultural institutions have existed for um, much of human history, they evolved greatly during the 20th century. Uh, while the world's population grew exponentially, the proportions of adherence to most of the major religious groupings actually remained relatively stable during the century. Um, there was a great expansion in public education at all levels from elementary to university, leading to greater levels of literacy and numeracy. Um, the great growth in formal education was accompanied by informal educational system that supports um, and enhances people's intellectual and cultural lives through things like uh, museums and libraries. And oftentimes these religious and cultural institutions were housed in great works of architecture, uh, such as those seen here. Um, next slide. And finally, theme, theme 10, uh, war of course has existed across human history. But again, the nature of, of 20th century warfare was markedly different from previous centuries. Uh, it was carried out on a much larger scale with new and more deadly weaponry. Uh, throughout the century, wars between nations, civil wars, and post-colonial struggles raged in places around the world. Uh, these were punctuated in the first half of the century by the two world wars, which involved most of the world's most powerful nations. And then the Cold War dominated geopolitics for this much of the second half of the century. And all of these con conflicts left myriad traces on the landscape many of which have come to be recognized as heritage. Um, you know, one of the strangest in my thinking of these is the joint security area at Panmunjom, which is in the bottom right here. Uh, this is the demilitar demilitarized zone between the two Koreas. Um, and here soldiers from the two countries still stand face to face while organized tour groups look on. Next slide, please. So you may have uh, noticed some overlap between themes, um, which we tried to convey in this graphic. Uh, places can and do fit into more than one theme. If you take that last example of the joint security area, it exemplifies war, uh, more specifically the Cold War, but also tourism and, and no doubt other themes as well. Um, while the 10 themes presented here represent global trends, the trends played out in many different ways depending on time and place. Um, and the authors of this document are from Australia, the US and Europe. And we just want to acknowledge we made every attempt to discuss themes from a global perspective, but we have to acknowledge that there's Western bias. And so we really encourage users to interpret these themes through their own geographical lenses, their own specific histories. Uh, and now I'm turning it back over to Chandler. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Um... So the framework is a means of organizing history to identify and contextualize sites, people, and events. It is not in and of itself a history of the 20th century. It's a tool that will help those tasked with identifying, comparing, conserving, and interpreting 20th century heritage to achieve their goals. And it will help users broaden and diversify the types of places identified as heritage to better reflect the history of the 20th century and all of its complexity. Next slide. <clears throat> we created the 20th century historic thematic framework as a tool to support conservation of significant 20th century heritage places. And we've offered it freely for trial and use, debate and discussion. Our hope is that it is broad enough yet clear enough that it can be applied 
almost anywhere in the world. For that reason, we've translated into, it into French and now uh, recently released in Spanish. And we're currently working on having an Arabic version produced. It's anticipated that in some country, countries or regions, it will be adapted to make it relevant to that place. This can be done by identifying new themes or sub-themes that reflect a, re a region's own heritage. Next slide. So today's workshop is part of the European workshop series organized by ISC 20C to introduce the thematic framework to a wide audience and show how it can be used in a European context. Our first regional workshop done by the GCI uh, was done in 2021 with an African group called MOHOA, uh, which was looking at the modern heritage of, on the African continent. And last May, we partnered with the Department of Culture and Tourism in Abu Dhabi to create a thematic framework workshop for heritage professionals working in the Middle East. Each of the workshops in the European series, aside from this one, which is introductory, is exploring a sub-theme from the framework, which is a very good way to unpack the themes, which as Gail demonstrated, can really be quite dense. This, these workshops will explore their applicability to actual built heritage. For example, the first European workshop focused on new nation states, which is a sub-theme of theme six entitled Internationalization, New Nation States, and Human Rights. Also, the theme of health will be explored in a later workshop, which draws on several sub-themes, which fall under the theme of accelerated scientific and technological development. The GCI is also working with other regional groups to create some additional workshops in the future in places like Asia and South America. Next slide. So in closing, uh, we want to acknowledge all the authors, contributors, and advisors who've worked on this endeavor over the years. This was a wide ranging and collective effort that drew, drew on the expertise and advice of many people. Next slide. Uh, this is the photo image credit, next slide more photo image credits. Next slide. Thank you for your attention. This is the end of our presentation. And next slide. We're now going to have a, a five minute break and we will be back at um, 1745 to uh, begin the second part of this workshop. So I'll see you in five minutes. Well, three minutes actually. <laughs> three minutes. We'll see you in three minutes. Welcome back, everyone. We had a very short break, I know. Um, but uh, I hope you've managed to have a few seconds to grab a cup of tea or whatever. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so um, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, I hope that you're getting, starting to get a bit of a, an insight into the document and its use. Um, but one thing I did want to mention um, was that I think it's really important to say that this particular document complements the efforts of many of the other organizations um, that have been working in more specific areas of interest for 20th century heritage over many years. And one of the things that um, it can do is to fill the gaps for some of the areas of heritage where we don't yet have focused attention uh, or the research that we may have in some particular areas. Um, so the next part of um, the webinar um, involves three um, eminent professionals who have been working in different ways to increase understanding um, about um, for the recognition of and the conservation of the heritage of this era. Um, and we have three case studies that illustrate how the thematic approach um, is or has been used as a way to advance um, recognition and protection uh, in, two, in, the, in, in the case of two specific countries, uh, Denmark and um, England, and also for, for specific heritage um, uh, typologies, uh, industrial heritage, um, clearly something that's very important um, in the post-industrial 20th century uh, heritage. Can I have the next slide, please? 
So um, the IFC 20 is very interested to promote um, the use of the historic thematic framework and hope that it can we can be able to demonstrate today the different ways that you might be able to use this particular document. I mean, of course, we've got this opportunity has been mentioned to, to use it to help identify and survey and assess uh, works. That's a sort of very typical use, but it can also be used as a way to connect communities and communities' histories um, and countries and, and, and regions or, or cities' histories to the communities um, and people's places that they particular value. So as I said before, connect informal history, the personal history and place, and therefore engage communities in this process. Um, and that's really important as um, heritage conservation is increasingly being um, driven from the bottom up and also recognised the importance of it being a collective effort. Um, I think, as we said before, there's also this opportunity to better illustrate the range of values, um, which can also be important in the way that we interpret uh, these histories. It's really a really important part of our uh, process is to interpret um, heritage places and to, to use interpretation of a way of promoting <clears throat> and sharing understanding and knowledge. Um, but also the idea that the, the framework and the themes that might be identified in your particular places might be used to stimulate um, specific thematic studies. Um, and that's something that's going to be explored more in some of our future European workshops. Um, so um, <clears throat> this, of course, is all based on the premise that more, the more we know about our history and heritage, the more people know about history and heritage, the better they'll understand why it's important and the more support we'll have for conserving it. So we have three short presentations now, followed by a round table um, that will also include um, all today's presenters. Uh, as you're listening to these talks, if you think of questions that you would like to put forward in the round tables, please drop them into the Q&A and um, we'll be moderating that discussion. So can I have the next slide, please? Let me dive in and introduce our first uh, speaker, uh, Dr. James Tue. Um, uh, James is a consultant and industrial historian and exhibit curator. He's based in Barcelona, but is joining us from the UK today. Uh, he has been um, really instrumental and involved in a number of the thematic studies that be, has been undertaken by Tiki, um, the, um, the, the um, specialist um, technical committee of ICOMOS that's involved in industrial heritage. Uh, he's also been involved in um, uh, studies that have helped to um, drive uh, World Heritage nominations to better recognise industrial heritage places. So I'm going to, at this point, ask James to, to join us. Thank you very much. James is going to talk about Tiki's work in developing their thematic studies in order to advance recognition of industrial heritage places. Welcome, James, and thank Hi, Susan. Thanks very much. Um, am I audible and visible? You are, and uh, I think we'll have your first slide, please. Next Thank slide. you. OK, so uh, I was asked to come along to the uh, presentation this morning, uh, this afternoon, uh, to present the work that Tiki has been doing for uh, the last 30 years. Uh, from 19, early 1990s, uh, we were asked to um, help uh, ICOMOS and the UNESCO to uh, have a better understanding of the, the sector, which we're particularly involved in, uh, which is uh, the industrial sector. So if you look at the next slide, Tiki, if you're not familiar with it, is the uh, International Committee for the Conservation of Industrial Heritage. We're a, uh, an international association uh, which focuses on promoting and assisting understanding conservation of the industrial heritage. You can move the next slide. Uh, and so uh, from the early 90s, we we're working on advising uh, uh, ICOMOS to have a better understanding of a sometimes quite complicated uh, sector. So from 2000, we signed an agreement with ICOMOS, which, as the text says, uh, allowed us to uh, uh, expertizing application for the World Heritage List to understand it better. And it says, touching on the main fields and branches of industrial heritage. Well, fields and branches in, industrial, in the industrial field basically mean that the industrial sectors, this is how industry is understood by government economists and, and, and us. So sectors such as mining, iron and steel, food construction and so forth. This is how industry is typically understood uh, by, in general and certainly within the conservation field. So we move on to the next slide. Uh, by the early, uh, early 2000s, I think we've heard this mentioned, ICOMOS published a, a report called Filling the Gaps, which identified uh, in their search for a, a more credible, representative and balanced list, 
industry is one of the areas which was uh, least well understood. Uh, and uh, Tiki was pressed to start producing these uh, thematic studies, which would contextualize, provide a context by which uh, individual in industrial sites might be understood. Uh, so moving on to the next slide. Uh, so we've now produced uh, nine of these studies uh, since, uh, since uh, the early, early 2000s. This is the most recent one, look at the textile industry. Uh, it was produced by a, a Polish, German and British collaboration. Uh, the next one, this shows this one that I did two, three years ago about the water industry, water supply and water purification. Uh, and the third slide shows the one which we've most recently produced uh, uh, on, the, on the petroleum industry. And I'm gonna use this to, uh, to illustrate the methodology which we have. Uh, so there's generally been two um, delivery mechanisms producing these thematic studies. Uh, on the one hand, occasionally states parties which are nominating a site will commission a study. Uh, this was done for canals. Uh, the Canadians commissioned a study on the canals. Uh, collieries was done jointly by the British and German governments. Uh, railways were sponsored by, uh, by Austria. Uh, and the alternative way, which is uh, how I've been involved, has been asked particular uh, specialist to do the study. So uh, bridges were done by, by American specialist, uh, quarries, um, company towns, uh, and the examples I've given you now. So these are the way which these studies have been produced up until now. So we look at the next slide, how do these, how do these projects typically work? So usually we've worked out a methodology which has sort of five main sections. The first part is to produce uh, a, a, an academically acceptable historical summary of the, of the sector under review at a, at a global level. The second part is to try and identify the major historical themes. Uh, this question of themes was touched on by both Chandler and Gale uh, as a way of uh, <clears throat> working out what are the main uh, threads running through the history of this particular sector, which we might want to uh, try and, 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 uh, and see reflected. The third part tries to identify the, the particular typologies of structure, of site, of, of landscape, uh, which are important both uh, in terms of their being rare and outstanding and also the normal and representative uh, examples. The fourth part looks briefly at the, uh, the criteria which uh, of external universal value, which might be relevant to the particular sector. And, and finally, we produce a number of case studies which try to illuminate and illustrate the, the sites and the values and attributes they have, uh, not actually making recommendations. Ikemos was quite keen that we should not uh, get into individual recommendations, but just show the sort of sites which might be, might be suitable uh, for, for nomination. So the next slide, this looks uh, at how uh, this re reflected within the oil industry. So the, main, the five main themes in the oil industry, we looked at the many thousands of years, oil was harvested in a natural way from the ground and used for a variety of different, different uh, materials. Uh, next slide, from the 1860s, uh, the beginning of its transformation into an industrial sector starts off with uh, what's usually referred to as the Pennsylvania model, the discovery and exploitation of oil uh, in Ontario and Pennsylvania. Uh, it, it then spreads in, in the third phase. We look at the uh, next slide, the international diffusion of oil production around the world. This is a slide from Chile, but I could have chosen, chosen obviously, many, many more. Uh, next slide, the fourth sector we looked at as, as it all becomes the, the global hegemonic energy source, uh, certainly by the beginning of the First World War. This slide slowing uh, Standard Oil's headquarters in, in Manhattan. And then the fifth uh, thematic, thematic strand, next slide, uh, looks at from the 1950s as oil becomes the feedstock for the petrochemical industry. And we see the extraordinary uh, expansion of oil as a material for so many different materials and many different uh, products in our, in our own lives. So the next slide, um, <clears throat> uh, so the sort of things we're then identifying was the characteristic uh, sites or objects or materials uh, which might be sought uh, within these uh, cri criteria which we've worked out. Should they be found uh, in a con suitable condition, uh, a suitable level of uh, authenticity and integrity to be conserved? The next slide, just go quickly uh, illustrating some of the sorts of places we're looking at. This is an early production from the Pennsylvania model. This is in Ontario. Next slide. Uh, we've already looked at this, the uh, distribution of oil uh, and, and through its most common uh, product, petroleum. And the next slide. Okay, so how useful are these uh, thematic studies? Uh, so you move on to the next slide, you can have an idea of the sort of uh, sites which have been recognized drawing on these thematic studies. Uh, the Canal Monuments List, for instance, uh, was used to 
understand a whole series of uh, canal sites which have been added to the World Heritage List. Uh, the next section uh, shows some of the uh, places which were uh, better understood uh, thanks to the, the coal mine study. Next slide, uh, the water uh, the water study I did was used to uh, inscribe Augsburg in Germany, which is the site we briefly saw just now a couple of years ago. And the oil study, the next slide, is currently being used to look at sites in Canada, Saudi Arabia, and other countries where oil, which of course is the, the arguably the most important material of the 20th century in its, in its, in its impact, uh, finding sites which will suitably reflect that importance, quite a challenging process. Uh, is going on uh, at, at the moment. So the next slide. So uh, various sites, themes and thematic areas are under construction, under consideration at the moment. Uh, raw manufacturers, that's not really relevant for the 21st century, uh, but uh, these others, iron steel and production, uh, these are all incredibly important sectors which are not well understood, uh, very difficult to understand individual sites, landscapes, uh, buildings uh, without a more global contextual study in order to substantiate an, an evaluation assessment of their, of their significance. Next slide. So uh, the issues to resolve uh, when approaching these studies, uh, how to fund them. Uh, we've usually had to spend 10, 15,000 euros, something like this, in order to fund one using a, a, an individual uh, uh, specialist. They're desk-based studies, so there's very little travel involved. Uh, and it's keen to remember these are not in any way inventories. These are these are thematic studies. They're not trying to find all the sites. The idea is that once the study has been produced, the information it contains will be used to then identify sites which uh, match the significance levels which we've tried to identify. Uh, and a third question, question who, how can they can be independent? It's very important that the information presented shouldn't be seen to favor any particular area or country. So some sort of authorial independence is quite, uh, is quite significant. So next one. So a few, a few conclusions to, to, to draw in. Um, <clears throat> I think they've been very successful in allowing individual sites to be put into a global context to be understood properly. Uh, I think they've also been uh, effective in being credible. Uh, they've been transparent. So there's never been a sensation that the, the studies had a particular uh, agenda or, 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 or ax to grind. Uh, they certainly have helped uh, recognition of sites of, of sectors which are often poorly understood. Uh, in case of oil, very difficult to find historic sites which have uh, been conserved for a long time. In the sec in the textile sector, on the contrary, the, the reverse is the problem. There are millions of uh, historical textile mills around the world, and trying to choose which ones are the most significant is quite a challenge. Um, and uh, But it has certainly helped the recognition of industry as a, a sector of importance uh, for heritage around the world uh, with the these series of studies which produced uh, since we began in the, say, the late 1990s. Okay, that's what I had to contribute. I hope it's been useful. And uh, if there's any questions, we can deal with them in the uh, round table in a few minutes. Thank you very much, uh, James. Um, thank you. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, well, yes, I think that was so interesting, James. Um, his presentation illustrated how having identified the themes, you can then use the themes to frame research, in this case, uh, globally, that can lead to the identification and protection of heritage places that relate to those particular themes. And also that, that idea of being able to use it to determine relative levels of significance of the types of places that might represent those themes. So let's take a step back now um, and look at a case study that um, is um, attempting to use the 20th century historic threat thematic framework as an organizing framework for a national approach to identifying and advancing um, uh, conservation of 20th century heritage. And I'm really delighted to introduce Dr. Jens Tofgaard, um, who is the head of the Cultural Heritage Department at the Dens Museums and chairman of Denmark's Historic Buildings Council, um, and is an expert uh, advising the ministry on, um, of culture on listed buildings. Um, Jens has broad experience in raising public awareness about built heritage and protection of significant places, buildings and areas through um, planning. Uh, he is also an advocate for the preservation of 20th century uh, heritage related to significant historical developments in housing 
industry and infrastructure. So thank you very much, Jens, um, for joining us. We're really looking forward to hearing about um, this in relation to your work uh, on a national scale in Denmark. Thank you so much. Uh, as mentioned, I, was, I am the head of uh, the Denmark's Historic Building Council. It's a, a council that advises the Minister of Culture on built heritage and listed buildings in particular. Could we have the next slide, please? Um, today, I'll give a presentation on why and how using a thematic approach is useful when dealing with 20th century heritage. Uh, with the 20th century historic thematic frameworks as, as an inspiration, uh, the Council has formulated a new strategy for listed buildings. This strategy was, will be presented to the public next, mo next month and effectuated over the coming years. Next slide, please. Denmark has had a law about listed buildings since 1918, but initially uh, this law was focused on the pre-industrial period. 4,000 properties are listed, and most of these are from, from before uh, 1900. Buildings from the middle and the late part of the 20th century has long been considered too new and too unimportant to warrant heritage protection. However, the present extensive and rapid changes to the built environment have forced the issue into consideration. The Danish listed building law has a minimum age requirement of 50 years. Uh, this now includes buildings from the 1970s, so we need to take on the period from 1945 to 19. 75. Next slide, please. One important reason why Danish heritage protections, uh, protection has shied away from the task of uh, taking on this time period is the paralyzing scale of the building mass. Uh, as shown here, uh, the post-war boom of the 1950s, 60s and 1970s produced an enormous uh, building stock. Uh, this time period, uh, encompasses a third of all buildings uh, remaining today in Denmark. So the task of, of taking on this period is, is quite huge. Moving on, uh, some things has, uh, has been done already. Uh, in this challenge, uh, challenging environment, heritage protection professionals have resorted to another method. An exclusive group of established modernist masterpieces has over the year been added to the listed buildings. These listings follow what could be called a canon of architectural works by well-known Danish architects like Arne Jacobsen, Jørn Utzon, and others. Of course, groundbreaking modernist architecture like this do unquestion unquestionably uh, belong to the listed buildings of the post-war era. However, it has been increasingly evident that this canonical method of selecting uh, when it stands alone, it is leading to a strong bias for specific building types and the upper social strata. And as seen as on this map, uh, a consequence is a geographical skewing towards the country's most affluent uh, region in and near the capital. Moving on, we need to take the task of representing the architecture and history of the 20th century series. We have already identified some biases and now we need some act. Overlooked groups, overlooked developments, experience must be addressed. The lack of representation is of course a heritage professional problem. Uh, for instance, the Danish listed building law stipulates that, and I quote, the representation of different living, living conditions, work experiences and broader social developments should be included. And as seen, uh, that is hardly the case now. But furthermore, the lack of representation is also a democratic problem. In a democracy, heritage protection needs to be inclusive. If the public at large cannot see their own history reflected, the legitimacy of heritage protection can erode. Therefore, much can be gained if we broaden our approach and establish a more inclusive listing practice. A broader assessment of potential heritage can lead to a wider representation of different groups, regions, and identities. And in this way, the acceptance of heritage conservation will grow if more people see their own history reflected. Moving on, 
the a way to set a new agenda for a listed building in Denmark is to apply a thematic approach. Um, this is a way to overcome the paralysis and of uh, the massive scale and to expand our understanding of listed buildings from uh, being unique icons to being important examples of a history larger than the building itself. Inspired by the historic thematic framework, the Historic Building Council in Denmark has formulated a new strategy for listing buildings. The purpose of the strategy is to make the operational link between the overarching global history of the 20th century as portrayed in the historic thematic framework uh, and build a link towards the assessment and protection of uh, specific themes and specific buildings. Uh, this strategy is a Danish interpretation of the framework's uh, global narrative. Moving on, the strategy uh, operates with nine themes. Uh, time forbids to, uh, to, for me to make a detailed introduction to all nine themes, but I'll elaborate on three, on the, three of them uh, in, a, in a moment. The first five themes uh, selected are of an overarching nature that uh, are relevant to buildings uh, across uh, the different types. Uh, the first one is community and civic society. Uh, I'll elaborate on that in a bit. Uh, the second one, form and function, uh, taking on the architectural trends of the period. Uh, city and countryside, uh, uh, inspired by uh, historical frameworks uh, first theme um, on infrastructure and planning. We have a theme on energy and mobility uh, from uh, oil to green energy uh, and a theme on building materials and sustainability. Uh, this one looks at the technical side of buildings and the plethora of new building materials introduced in the post-war era. The four themes at the bottom, the uh, last four themes, uh, are formulated on the basis of functions and building types. The first one, housing for all, uh, takes on the uh, post-war population boom and uh, the housing uh, policies that it required. Uh, the second one uh, is centered at uh, workplaces, industry and services. And the uh, Nordic welfare state is also a, a theme in, in itself. Uh, I'll elaborate on, on that also in a bit. And uh, lastly, we have uh, leisure and green spaces as a, a, um, uh, as a theme uh, draw, that draws on the historical thematic framework theme eight. Uh, moving on to uh, community and uh, civic society. The first theme of, of the Danish strategy inspired by the theme number six. Uh, um, this one deals with uh, associations, uh, non-governmental or non-profit organizations, uh, an important uh, part of uh, society often overlooked uh, when looking at society as a whole, uh, focusing on either the state or, or uh, private, uh, private investors. Uh, in Denmark, this, this uh, uh, civil society, civil, civic society uh, organization had a, a huge impact on social housing, on uh, cooperative businesses, and, uh, and furthermore, uh, with this theme, we would also like to uh, expand on uh, the idea of meeting places, uh, formal meeting places, like for instance, uh, monuments or community halls, but also the informal uh, meeting places uh, created by architects, uh, for instance, in, in making uh, livable cities or livable neighborhoods uh, based on the assumption and when the basic needs are fulfilled for shelter and, uh, and, uh, and food and, and so on, uh, people need uh, meaningful interactions and that's a uh, requirement has been taken serious by uh, architects in this period. Moving on, we also have, uh, thank you. Moving on, we also have uh, a, a theme on energy and mobility uh, inspired by theme two and four uh, from the historical uh, thematic historical framework. Uh, this is uh, based upon the history of oil that we've just uh, heard so much about and uh, 
uh, it also impacted life uh, very much in, in Denmark. Uh, the energy consumption in Denmark uh, doubled between 1950 and 1972, when Denmark was the country in the world with the highest per capita consumption of oil. Uh, of course, it, it led to uh, uh, developments in uh, housing, uh, homes grew because it could be easily uh, heated by uh, oil uh, uh, and also uh, transportation, uh, automobiles and uh, planes uh, led to a a whole new infrastructure. But in 1973, just in the time period uh, I'm discussing here, uh, the, an energy crisis led to uh, a new way of, uh, of uh, getting energy moving away from fossils to uh, renewable in, uh, energy. And I think we need uh, in a, in a uh, society moving away from uh, fossil fuels, uh, we need to preserve this history, both of the oil industry, but also the early history of the new renewable energy. Moving on to the next slide, uh, drawing inspiration from uh, theme one and two in the uh, historical uh, framework, we had the Nordic welfare state. Uh, the expansion of the welfare state over the middle of the 20th century led to a fundamental change in Danish society. Um, the com very comprehensive Nordic model that, uh, of the welfare state that combines social security, government regulation of the economy, uh, but also uh, extensive uh, public service uh, for citizen in, citizens in all so, uh, sectors of uh, all phases of life. Um, the rollout of this public service led to a major building program. Um, nurseries, kindergartens, schools, high schools, universities, home for the elderly, hospitals, libraries, and all sorts of public buildings were rolled out uh, across the country in, in this uh, co comparably short time period. And uh, concluding with the last slide, uh, a, brief, uh, a brief sketch of the method. Now we've started from, from the overarching uh, themes and uh, now we need to, uh, over the next years, uh, make them work. Uh, we need to start a broad discussion of these themes and how they relate to, to heritage values and uh, both within the heritage community itself, but also uh, in a broader societal context. We need to make a uh, thematic surveys of uh, th sub themes, much like uh, James uh, uh, were expanding upon. We need to identify it and evaluate the listing candidates and uh, in that uh, order also reflect on the representations of social groups of different uh, regions and of uh, uh, different uh, uh, yeah, other, other uh, uh, things to, to take into consideration. And when the candidates are selected, we need to conserve. And um, down the road, we will have a, an uh, evaluation of this process, what has been achieved, what uh, gaps remains to be filled, and uh, what has been overlooked in this uh, thematic approach. So uh, we are just at the start of a very important and very uh, interesting uh, strategy to, to change the way to list buildings in Denmark. That was all for me, thank you. Great, thank you so much, um, Jens. Really appreciate uh, hearing about uh, this exciting work that you're doing. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Um, so now I'm delighted to introduce our third speaker this evening, Dr. Elaine uh, Harwood. Um, Elaine is an architectural historian, uh, well known to many people working in this in this realm. Uh, she works with Historic England, um, and between '96 and 2004 was the post-war specialist in its listing team. Uh, she's been engaged in this specific effort 
to advance um, recognition and identification of, of uh, modern heritage specifically and post-war and beyond for many years now. She's an honorary uh, fellow of the RIBA, a co-editor of the 20th um, Century Architecture and the Monograph series on 20th Century Architects published by the 20th Century Society. And she's the author of the fantastic um, book, Space, Hope and Brutalism, uh, which is the winner of the Art Book uh, Award for 2016 and um, Chamberlain, Powell and Bond. And she's currently writing on new towns and architects uh, as we can see here. So um, thank you, Elaine. Elaine is going to um, reflect on the experience of English heritage in the late 90s and early 2000s when they were undertaking their really, I think what was really seminal work to strategically identify and list um, this heritage uh, across the UK. Um, really looking forward to hearing your reflections, Elaine. Um, over to you. Thank you. Next slide, please. Thank you. Yeah, they, um, we've got now 900, as of Tuesday, 991 post-1945 listed buildings or groups of buildings where, say, there's a housing estate of several items that counts as one. Hasn't always been that easy. This is Akron Burley School, which was listed following a thematic study of schools in 2013-14. But these studies don't just include modern buildings, though um, at Camberley, are very proud of their brutalism. It's been used for launch of my new book in a couple of weeks. Uh, but its uh, thematic studies was a way of addressing all styles of buildings by a great range of architects, so just as they're discovering in Denmark. Next, please. But I'm going to go back 50 years and trying to explain this development when the eminent historian Nicholas Pevsner, German refugee who'd really transformed architectural history in Britain, identified the sort of iconic modern movement buildings of the 1930s in Britain. And they were finally listed 1970-91. He identified 50, 38 were listed. But Pefner, next slide, please, had ab absolutely no interest in Art Deco. This was called the Monument Excrescence in his um, guides to the buildings of England. And when it, it, it was under consideration, about to be listed in 1980 uh, for its importance, I suppose, as a sort of symbol of new industries in a new part of London out, out towards where Heathrow now is, uh, and this sort of new style from America, this blend of modernism and classicism, very popular with ordinary people that don't have an architectural appreciation, um, you know, it's interesting perhaps this interest in serious architecture, but if you're interested in popular culture or just like buildings, these Art Deco is something that transcends um, all, all walks of life, really. And a bulldozer went through it one bank holiday about when it was about to be listed. And this prompted this series of studies done thematically of pre-1945 buildings. And when, next slide please, the first post-45 building was eventually listed in 1987, it was a classical one. So again, and you see it here as it was built, and next slide please, as it was then altered with listed building consent, following the listing and the, uh, the adaptation replaced, Bracken House was a, a, a newspaper offices with the printing presses. It's really close to the St. Paul's Cathedral, which is why it's classical. And the presses moved out of the, city, uh, the center of the city. The uh, office building took the site. It was all set for demolition. Then it was listed. And Michael Hopkins and partners did this conversion work, which and their additional building is now separately listed in its own right. Next slide, please. But, um, 
by ne- when we were looking at the first post-war listed buildings between from 1987, the legislation was changed so that buildings over 30 years old, so a bit, bit, not quite like Denmark, but 30 years from when the first concrete hit the foundation trench. And it, again, it was done thematically by building type, um, hopefully bringing in a great range of styles, works by architects other than the, the really famous ones. And very few of uh, in what then historic English heritage, now historic England, same organization, very few of the recommendations were accepted. And so in 1992, English Heritage secured additional funding from the government. We're an autonomous public body financed by the government. So we've got an extra little kick to do this three-year study again by building type. And the list expanded from 20-something up to about 200. Next slide, please. There was a series of exhibitions uh, with this little booklet beginning in 92, where that list was taken from. Next slide, please. Uh, An exhibition in a forecourt of a major London railway station at Waterloo that addressed these issues by means of a um, little panel show and handout leaflet. Next slide, please. And then once the work was done, you see the thematic studies here. If you if you can read those uh, building types of churches to bridges, higher education, new towns, rural housing, down to sculpture and, and war memorials, things like that. Uh, exhibitions at the Royal Institute of British Architects, up in Sheffield, where some of the most significant social housing was. And the public were asked to give their views and comments, which then got fed into presentation to the government minister that finally made the decision. And and larger numbers of buildings were eventually listed in 1998. Most of our recommendations were accepted. Uh, and it, it was seen as, as a breakthrough in convincing the great and good. Next slide, please. Yeah, so I think we've gone through these about styles. We've looked at this thing about um, it brings to head architects that aren't perhaps so well known or are regional with the caveat that here the initially very reliant on what was published in the architectural press. But I think it helps us understand the story of buildings. And more recently, we've done thematic studies of shell concrete structures, um, post-war landscapes, and post-modernism, dare I say the word, in a conference organised like this. But a little bit of style, but most importantly, the the thematic studies have helped us understand the brief that was given the architect and the evolution of a building type. Next slide, please. So that you're going from something like the Royal Festival Hall, one of the very first post-1945 buildings to be listed, and grade one, to uh, the first repertory theatre, um, next slide, please. The Belgrade Theatre, to the first to be publicly funded. You see, it? there's some of that still style still there from the, the festival era. But next slide, please. If you look at the work of Peter Morrow, essentially a theatre specialist who worked on the uh, Royal Festival Hall, that lighting gantry, that circular donut at the top of that dark slide, overshadowed a theatre, uh, a, a, a 
extended stage. So the stage can be brought forward. So it's not quite in the round, but it becomes a giant horseshoe. And this sort of idea of horseshoe plans or theatres in completely in the round is part of an evolution that transforms something as traditional as theatre buildings into something a wholly new idiom within the building type in the post-war period. Next slide, please. And you see it very well in the National Theatre, where you've got three stages, each one different, within the one building that you see at the top there. And this kind of work is still very much going on. Our latest studies, next slide, please, are into department stores, uh, a victim, of course, of the internet and of COVID and shutdowns of the high street. And this work's just starting. A national survey's just been approved. I noticed there was a note thing in the chat about um, grain silos, and that's something that troubles me too. It's one that's gone away. Hopefully, we're going to be in time with department stores already to have been listed. This small, relatively small example from the rebuilding of the bombed town of South Sea, part of the naval port of Portsmouth. Next slide, please. And most recently, slightly larger, tougher, built in car park at the back that's quite brutalist, up in Sheffield. I can put Sheffield on. It's Cole Brothers, John, now John Lewis, um, closed at the beginning of COVID, never reopened, uh, right in the heart of Sheffield city centre, where there's already a list of cooperative stores. So um, the, this, it has prop, fate now facing issues of reuse so far um, quite successfully. But I think, dread to think what I've missed in such a short survey. I hope that's given you the basic and provided uh, a contrast with what's happening or enforcement of what's happening in Denmark and something that we can take further in the discussion now. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Elaine. Uh, I think it's really interesting to, to see that work and how that rolled out at, at that time and this sort of study of themes and sub themes that um, I think now, you know, Many years later, doing the thematic framework, I think some of those themes and sub themes that were identified there were influential, I would say, in the development of this particular work. Um, can I have the next slide, please? And can I ask all of our panelists, um, James and Jens and Chandler, to come back on screen? And why don't we just unmute? And I hope you won't have much background um, noise. We have, uh, let me see how much time we've got. We've got 20 minutes to have our round table now. Um, and I have some questions for you. And then we have some questions that are coming through in the chat and we may have more as we start um, to reflect on things. Um, but can I just, um, whilst we're gathering our questions together, can I ask you um, uh, th th some question, a question about, um, you've all talked about this um, in different ways. Um, and particularly, I think that for Jens and, and Elaine, um, you've mentioned some of the benefits of using a sort of historic themes as a way to organize your research to, to uplift places. Um, but I was particularly interested in how you thought some of the benefits might be or how you might use it to get public support um, specifically and a little bit more about how it might be a way to engage the public in the process that's now so much part of um, uh, you know, the need when we're doing this sort of working now. I mean, I know Jens, you're just starting to do this, but how did you think that you might use it as a, a mechanism to engage the public and how were you planning to, to do that? And if I can ask that to you, Jens, first, and then I'm gonna ask Elaine to just elaborate a little bit more on, on that. Um, James, you are in darkness. I don't know if you've got your camera on or if you just have no light. No, um, I don't know why I'm not visible. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, we'll, we'll keep, oh, there you are. Now I can see. Oh, no. I it's think you again. might have your, yeah, you've got your blur screen, I would suggest, and you might be not close enough to the camera, would be a guess for me, of because you suddenly appeared out of the black, the dark. Oh, oh there you are. Yes. We can, 
No, I mean, you need to put your minus you to, helmet on. Yeah, you need, you need to um, move closer to the camera or turn your blur off. Um, Jens, I'm sorry, do you remember that question? Is how, how you uh, yes, I do, you and thank you so much. Learning? Hmm, yeah. Well, <laughs> the easy answer would be that the thematic framework and the themes in themselves are uh, a tool for broadening uh, public understanding and, and public support because it connects the individual um, sites or buildings to a, a, a broader uh, history, uh, broader developments that can uh, that the public at large uh, know and can identify themselves with. And um, I think it will uh, ring more, um, what you say, more familiar to uh, to the public uh, when uh, when it's um, uh, pieced together as as a a, a, a theme. Uh, we're taking this uh, global narrative of the 20th century from from the historic thematic framework, but we've also been very uh, aware that it, this needs to be a particular Danish story, uh, something that uh, sets Denmark apart from from other countries. Of course, most uh, developments of the 20th century are global in 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 their in their scale. Um, but we would like to uh, find some examples of uh, of Denmark being a, a particular case in in some ways, and uh, I think that will reflect uh, on a on a local uh, public uh, to make it more uh, more interesting and uh, uh, more identity building. And then the next step, of mm -hmm. course, is getting closer to the specific sites and the specific uh, um, uh, the specific buildings. Uh, and engaging with the local communities, uh, um, well, that is a, a that's a, a big task to take on from what you say from the top down. So there needs to be a, 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 a yeah a, a collaboration between uh, national the national level and the uh, local level. And uh, uh, we luckily we have a, a national uh, NGO uh, that is um, a. Which is an umbrella uh, organization for all, for a lot of uh, local uh, conservation uh, NGOs, and I think uh, that could be a very useful uh, partner for collaboration on, on the, um, what you say, to engage in in uh, local communities all over all over the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, and and Elaine, maybe I could ask you um, if you could talk a little bit about how. Think using that sort of thematic approach might have helped you engage with the public a little bit more. You mentioned some exhibitions and things like that, but I was interested to, to know whether um, during the process of your work, you may have changed public opinion, because my recollection was that you were starting from a very low level of public appreciation for this heritage, and through your process, you um, were able to increase that appreciation level somewhat um, very impressively. Could you talk a little bit about how that approach may have helped that or how you may have been able to, um, to, to move that level of support through your work? Thank you. Um, I suppose when we launched the survey in 1995, there was a national opinion poll that put support for our work at 66%, which was pretty good, considering that Prince Charles, now King Charles, had been rush, rubbishing modernism and particularly <laughs> post-war buildings with his own book, Vision of Britain, which also came out in 1987. So we were really starting at the nadir, at the point where modernism was absolutely at its nadir. And it's lovely seeing James Douay here because he was involved in the survey at that time, before long before I was. Um, so I think that growth of, um, obviously it's not just us, but there was a revival in modern, an interest in modernism generally, programs such as Grand Design about people building their own modern houses, things like that started to help, but certainly, getting out with publications, with exhibition, engaging in debate and radio on television. Um, let me wave a book at you, listed buildings. <laughs> you know, been, this is the third and heaviest 
of a series of volumes on this. I can wave one on brutalism at you, should you wait. You know, really start, started to come forward. But think about what you were saying about Denmark. One of the eight people we were getting support from was the uh, theater specialists, theater historians, and librarians. And librarians in the 1950s went to Denmark. They studied Frederick's Harvard Library outside Copenhagen, which was the model for libraries here. So British librarians were making Danish tours. And there's a direct influence on what you were doing on what, what was built here. So, uh, and getting the support of the professionals, say theater people and librarians were two very strong areas of support, really made a big difference. Mm -hmm. Great, and James, do you, I, mean, I know that the work you've been doing is through is through Tiki, but you did talk about how that work is, has um, changed public opinion a little bit more and, and Elaine referenced your work before. Is there anything else you wanted to add on that question? Yeah, there, there are two aspects I'd like to, to draw in, uh, Susan. I mean, the first part is that in these studies we've done, they conclude, I should have exaggerated this, with a, a seminar or a conference. Uh, so the water study, we had a seminar, uh, we had a conference in Barcelona. Uh, the oil seminar was held in Ontario uh, last month, uh, which the conclusions are presented, uh, a number of uh, other opinions are brought in. Uh, and the publication is then launched and published. And so it's presented, as, as Elaine said, to as wide a public as possible. Uh, books are produced, which can be read and easily accessed. So they're all on the internet. So this information is out there. Uh, and the other point to draw in is that this information is then available and used by those sites which are then being conserved. So the example of Augsburg, uh, when uh, Augsburg was inscribed on the World Heritage List, the town could use the thematic study we'd done to demonstrate to citizens, to anybody, mm. why their particular site was important in the context of the production, the use of water worldwide, why Olga was a, such a special place and merited the attention mm. of the of the, uh, of the nomination and inscription um, and all the care and investment which the city had put into it. So I think those two mm. sides would be the uh, the way that Tiki uses, is uses its study to bring in public support and, uh, and, uh, and participation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we had quite a specific question, which I'm going to just um, direct to Chandler, um, uh, if you'll indulge us for the moment, which was um, around the, the theme seven mm -hmm. um, and a question about, um, well, this particular question was relating, trying to relate some of the images that were shown to that themes. And maybe you could just talk a little bit more very briefly about the intent um, behind that theme, Chandler. Uh, yeah, that... Um... You know, as I said in my lecture, these these themes are qu quite uh, dense and we have a lot of ideas, but for theme seven, we were really talking about the sort of birth and codification of the conservation movement in the 20th century, which applied to both um, natural landscapes and uh, the built environment. So we had a picture of a couple of nat national parks, which were uh, created during the 20th century to conserve uh, habitat for animals and to preserve the natural setting. And we have some photos of historic places like um, uh, Warsaw, the rebuilt city of Warsaw, which was completely rebuilt. So the, it's, it's meant to be talking about the spirit of conservation and the laws that started to come into effect that and the listing of buildings and all of the things we've been about today are top sort of born in the 20th century um, as these became national rules and laws and practices so that's what is meant by uh, theme seven okay thank you okay um i wanted to ask you all a question just about this sort of this idea of looking at um, heritage and you know this idea of doing things thematically as we as Chandler had in his talk and others have mentioned there are a number of different ways that we do these sort of studies to organize how we're going to identify the places um, that we want to keep or justify their values um, in a sort of uh, uh, legislative sense or pr a process it, within the processes that have been developed nationally or internationally when you were doing your work I was interested to know um, how familiar this idea of sort of thematic histories were or doing a thematic approach 
was to the professionals in your organizations because you know we've made an assumption that most people understand these sort of approaches quite well i think that in some places that's true in other places it's not um so i was just interested to know how yeah how familiar um people were about you know approaching things in sort of a thematic way or whether you had to um uh you know how how hard was it for people to get on board with this approach um Jens if I can get you to start off I mean this is something that mm. you've approached that's quite new could you get support from your organization and others for looking at it in this particular way yeah I think it was uh uh, it, it was perhaps something new or th something perhaps a bit forgotten about. Uh, there was some uh, strides uh, within uh, these ideas of, uh, of uh, thematic uh, surveys and uh, uh, thematic um, approaches in the 1980s and 90s, but uh, they were more or less forgotten for, for, tw for 20 years. But I think when, when first uh, introducing this idea, I, I think it's rather self-explanatory. Uh, mm -hmm. it, when when it's uh, in introducing it to people, I think they um, it often comes very natural to to think of of uh, of building types as a theme, and where we had uh, well the the most uh, uh, the most challenging perhaps was the idea of a community as a as a theme uh that is more or less based on ideology or, or modes of thoughts or visions or dreams uh something that takes place in the in the mental space rather than as a it's much easier to talk about uh, housing as a, as a theme for instance uh, because it's it's much more tangible uh but but uh, we've tried and, and succeeded in uh in establishing this more um um uh, taking on also mental aspects uh when when defining themes Thank you. I mean, Elaine, this was something that you were doing quite a while ago, but you know, is it sort of an approach that has continued in the work that you've done with, Eng with English, Historic England as you've moved through time? And, um, and what have you learned from it? Have you changed your approach at all or have you sort of continued in a similar way? Continued in a similar way, really, to how we began. Uh, in 1992, we had a budget to bring in outside people so that where we didn't have an in-house knowledge um, we could bring in specialists such as an engineer to look at shell concrete construction for example mm -hmm. but now we're much more using money more of our own resources I think the, the organi organization is structured well differently um, but so it's about us learning from within about department stores or whatever which say is literally beginning with a meeting on that next Thursday so we write so it really is literally still happening but that's looking at a, a type that's not really been looked at in detail before so probably doing more smaller precise building types in greater depth um, than we were when it back in the 1990s when we were looking at all forms of retail in one overview within a sort of broad commercial framework uh, in 1994. So of course, lots of offices and I think one shop got listed. So now going back to look at something in more detail uh, and doing it within, uh, with using our own in-house resources. Mm -hmm. and, and Chandler, maybe you could comment a little bit, you know, this is the third workshop, as we've said. Um, um, do you want to comment about how this, the, this approach might have been received in some of the other places and with the other people that we've been talking to? Um, yes, I, I would comment on that. I mean, I think um, one of the points that I tried to make was that the thematic framework is meant to be uh, modified and, you know, taken as a starting point. And it, and we found in our in our Africa workshop and also in our Middle East workshop, there was a, a certain amount of resistance to some of our themes, and there was a sense that this was kind of a Western approach. And and they didn't, uh, for example, there was a great deal of discussion with the African group about um, how we were addressing uh, the 
colonial and post-colonial issues. And uh, they felt like that was so important in Africa that it should have been its own theme rather than a sub-theme within, the, uh, within the other one. So um, I think Jens is sort of demonstrating how you can take the thematic framework and, and modify it and make it appropriate to your region. Um, so there is sometimes a bit of resistance uh, to this thematic approach, but I would say um, we we know that and we we expected that might be the case, and I think uh, it's it's something that can be modified. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, uh, I have a question um, for Jens, but I'm going to use it for uh, um, I think it's relevant for many of our panelists. Um, really, just this basic very you know, from where you're starting now, um, is there broad-based support from the community for uh, Denmark's 20th century heritage? Um, and, um, you know, people are still losing, there's many places in the world where we're still losing things. So this process that you're starting now, are you really having to start from a, a very low base or have you got some support that you're building on or are you really having to kind of go from the, from the ground up? Well, we're, well, we're having a, a test case uh, just now. We are in uh, in the process of uh, listing a uh, Aarhus University, a, a well-known, at least in Denmark, a very well-known uh, mm -hmm. campus university. It's very uh, loved in in the in this uh, second largest cities in in Denmark. Very loved and 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 lauded uh, uh, building uh, or building site uh, we are just trying to list it uh, now and i think it will be mm -hmm. more or less of a, a test case to see uh, how how the support will uh, will be for for that case uh, but i should say that uh, as we are now in the process of taking on this uh, this very very new uh, in in conservation uh, terms very new uh, time period um, we are first uh, focus on establishing with it within the heritage professional community to um, to, to uh, make that a basis for moving on to the next two levels uh, one being the political level of course uh, uh, state politicians uh, local politicians uh, uh, local planners uh, uh, at the community levels uh, or the county level or whatever uh, and then uh, thirdly uh, the broad uh, public, both in a, in a national uh, context and a national discussion, uh, but when moving on to specific sites, of course, also in, in the local context. And, and this is where it, it becomes increasingly difficult to, uh, to raise awareness uh, from a sort of say top-down uh, position uh, when being a, a national body uh, uh, advising the, the Ministry of Culture. Uh, so there's a challenge ahead of us, and we'll be very well uh, aware of it. Mm -hmm. um, and James, I was interested to hear from you about how you see support may have changed for industrial heritage over the period that, that Tiki's been involved um, in this particular work and, and um, more generally, I mean, Clearly, at the beginning, the whole rationale for Tiki and the work that you were doing is to do this. But are you seeing a shift in appreciation for and better conservation outcomes for industrial heritage as a result of the work that you've been doing? Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> for sure. Uh, <laughs> industrial heritage, as you know, comes late to the, the whole conservation field. Uh, when I was beginning, uh, it was a very, very uh, um, un unappreciated and it spread partly because of understanding uh, partly because uh, it, it began with the industrialization in Britain and as the industrialization has spread to other countries, uh, then the, the whole issue becomes becomes suddenly relevant. Uh, and I think a lot of countries have found that the, of the of the historic resources they have available to do new things in old cities. There's far more industrial heritage available than in many other heritage fields or many more historic mm -hmm. obsolete factories uh, in in countries around the world than there are historic um, um, monasteries or churches or uh, or libraries and so mm -hmm. industrial heritage obviously a terrific resource 
uh, through the, the process of adaptive resource, which again has been a, a technique really pioneered and developed for industrial buildings uh, for uh, transforming post-industrial cities and making them relevant and useful again for their citizens. Hmm. Okay, thank you. I'm just realizing that we are, um, we are practically out of time. Um, I've got the timing right on my sheets. We're nearly at seven o'clock European time. It's 10 to, is that correct? Yes, okay, <laughs> thank you. So I'm just gonna ask, um, we need to wrap up, but just before we do, I just ask if there's any final comments from any of our um, panelists before we start to wrap up our um, conclusions. Anything else that you'd, you'd like to say based on any of the questions you've seen or anything that any of your other panelists have mentioned? Just a great oh, thank, thank you, you for, for the inspiration for the historical mm -hmm. thematic framework. I think it's, <laughs> it's a terrific uh, thing to offer to the global community. And yes, I, I agree. Perhaps it's it's Western uh, it's Western bias, but uh, we all have our biases. So uh, it's a terrific uh, inspiration for for all heritage but professionals uh, around the world. I think. Be interesting to know how many other countries are doing this kind of thematic approach mm -hmm. and, and see if there's anything that sort of what we've done in England can help and inform and if you have, you know, let me know. Mm -hmm. okay. James or Chandler, any final thoughts that you want to, to share? Uh, you no. mentioned it, I'm sorry, Chandler, you mentioned the relevance of, of, uh, of the thematic approach. I mean, for us, as I said at the beginning of my talk, it's 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 uh, instinctive. Industry is divided into sectors, so it's a very obvious way of going forward. But then when we started doing it in Britain, uh, as I said with that, I said in the early nineties, I mean it was a way of cross cutting uh, the, the the inventories, and we've always done, uh, as Chana mentioned, uh, chronological topographical surveys, doing the thematic way with just cutting across and picking up stuff which had just slipped through the net and wasn't being appreciated. So it's a really useful tool in that sense. Mm -hmm. Chandler, any final comments that you well, uh, not like really, to make? I mean, I just in terms of this thematic approach, I think I think many of us learned architectural history using a chronological approach or a canonic mm -hmm. approach, and that's the reason we've started at the beginning. We started listing buildings using a similar method because we learn history that way. Um, at least I did, and I think many people did. So this thematic approach is a is a bit different. And I know that it takes uh, a bit of rethinking because we have been looking at the, the world around us as historians or architectural conservators. So it's a matter of, of recalibrating, but it isn't really that hard because I think everyone is quite, it's quite easy to understand these themes throughout the world. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much to, um, to the four of you for your really interesting um, talks um, this evening. We really appreciate uh, the time that you've put in and for joining us. Um, it's my job now just to try and uh, wrap up with some conclusions before I hand um, back to Greta to announce some of the latest uh, about what's happening next. Um, I'm sorry that we didn't get to answer all of the questions that some of you may have had in the chat. I mean, some of them are quite specific to other regions and not our panelists. So um, I, if I get a chance, I'll try and answer that in the chat as we were wrapping up before the final minutes. Um, there's some questions about how we deal with obsolescence and conservation of these buildings that comes next. But, you know, I think part of the point of this uh, what we're talking about today is to make sure that we get places identified before they're threatened, identify their values so that they can then be conserved in ways that um, addresses how to balance that question of um, the amount of change that is relevant or, or that should be um, allowed, if you like, or, or permitted to in order to sustain the specific values that have been identified. So that that issue wasn't the specific topic of this conference today, but this is always the first step in the conservation process, understanding what we've got, why it's important, and that helps us to provide a roadmap for how that they should actually be, um, be conserved. Um, I hope you've been able to get a little bit of um, an insight into, um, into uh, the historic thematic framework, and it might stimulate some ideas about how 
uh, you might be able to use it yourself. Um, one specific thing that we often get asked, um, and so I'm just going to mention it very quickly, uh, you know, you'll notice that the framework is the 20th century historic thematic framework. Where did that come from? You know, why did we uh, not call it the modern, uh, the modern framework, for example, the, you know, the, the framework for modern heritage? That was because the ISC 20 is the 20th Century Heritage Committee. That's the genesis of this document. And in long discussions with ICOMOS at that point, we decided to call it that rather than associate it with a specific um, word that can be interpreted in many different ways in many different places and means different things. And so we, if you like, um, sidestep that issue by allowing for multiple interpretations of modernity and how it may play out and when it may play out and where it played out. So that's why the framework is sort of, is, is um, both thematic related to history, but also chronological. Um, and I think we even thought of the 20th century fairly loosely, uh, if, I might, if I might say that, recognizing that many of the things that uh, represented great rupture and change that occurred in the 20th century actually started in the century and centuries that preceded it. Um, so um, thank you very much to, to everyone. Um, I think this was really exciting to see how the framework was being used in different places, has been used uh, and is being used and some of the work that it might promote um, as the, one of the themes that's come up is this importance of engaging communities and, and people uh, in raising awareness of, of this heritage that we all care about so that we can adequate, adequately protect it and conserve it and how might the framework be used in a multitude of ways, including that more dem democratization of heritage conservation, both in identification and practice.